and gentlemen, welcome to the world famous Cafe Istanbul. You guys are always uh, welcome here. Um, um, we have uh, we're gonna we're doing a press release today for a very amazing event that we gotta have coming up. This is gonna be the inaugural event uh, of National Voodoo Day, and so we are here to talk about that. And uh, so I don't have a, a, lo a lot to say. I'm going to pass it to our esteemed panel here, and they will, uh, you know, tell us everything about National Voodoo Day that's going to be happening here in New Orleans. And we're modeling it after um, an event in, uh, in Benin. And um, I'm, I, I look forward to see what transpires over the next several years. So. I'll, I'll pass the mic over to you. Nate, you want to start? <coughs> I think Nate's going to start. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, how y'all doing today? Um, first off, thank you for being here. Um, we're starting with this first annual New Orleans National Voodoo Day, and purpose of which um, I guess the egg that was the initial inspiration was um, National Vodun Day in Benin, where they have a procession that goes through different sites relevant to the history of the transatlantic slave trade, and they've got healing ceremony and artistic installations all to commemorate um, what's going on, and they have a tree of no return, or sorry, a door of no return with an arch and a tree of remembrance and forgetting, and they include these in the procession. Um, in New Orleans, we as well have sites that are extremely relevant to the history of the transatlantic slave trade, so it seems natural to kind of complete that, and we want to eventually reach out to both Benin and Haiti and set up a relationship over these events that commemorate the same passage and struggle. Um, so our event serves as a sort of, um, not counter, but as a supplement to the event that happens in Benin. Um, with that in mind, we have a spiritual procession that we're planning to do from the Mississippi River at the Moonwalk and going through the French Market, um, North Peters and Esplanade, stopping at different sites like um, the auction site houses on the site where Solomon Northrop was sold, um, 12 Years a Slave, French market itself, and as we go along, we're going to have healing ceremonies and rituals to acknowledge what had happened, but also try to release some of that energy. You know, just speaking about the history of it is definitely an important thing to do, but there's a lot of energy that's still there, you know, there's a lot of intense emotions that remain, and absolving, acknowledging, and allowing these emotions and energies to be felt and appreciated is another important part of it, you know? I mean, one of the sites that we're doing is the La Marie Mansion, where a lot of tour guides constantly stop <coughs> because there was uh, this horrific woman, Madame La Marie, who was torturing and mutilating her enslaved people. And these tour guides, they go and they gawk at the site and they look at it and say what a horrific thing it is, where are the people showing up saying, we're sorry for what you went through? And speaking to those spirits that are still enraged and suffering there. You know, a lot of what we're planning has to do with the spiritual reparations and healing. Um, eventually we will end up at Congo Square where we have um, different people from different practices. We've got some Mardi Gras Indians that are gonna come and speak about their unique history and how that ties into spirituality and culture, helping people persevere through suffering. And um, we also have the Iwe priest that's going to um, have another ceremony, and afterwards we're going to go into a large-scale voodoo ceremony of our own. Um, and that's a brief introduction of what we're going to be getting into. I'm going to pass the mic now that I've laid that down. Next up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lil Dorsey, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the history of voodoo in New Orleans. The history of voodoo in New Orleans is a spiritual gumbo. Its roots are grounded in Benin, flavored with the indigenous traditions of the people of Bobancha, and rounded out with the beliefs of Haitian voodoo and other African traditional religions. 
New Orleans National Voodoo Day will include a ceremonial procession to monuments and sites of significance to the history of enslaved people in New Orleans. This walking ceremony of collective remembrance includes nine points throughout New Orleans with voodoo offerings and prayers at each locale. From the time the first slave ships arrived in New Orleans in 1719, untold thousands of enslaved Africans arrived at the Mississippi Riverfront, where our procession will begin. Here they were subjected to a grim future of unimaginable tortures. From these tragedies, the religion of New Orleans voodoo was birthed in the spirit of resilience and resistance. The procession will also include stops at the French market where enslaved people sold produce, crafts, and other items. Here the previously enslaved Rose Nicole became famous for her coffee, making her the foremother of the coffee culture that still thrives there today. Jackson Square, this was the site where many enslaved Africans arrived and were inhumanely sold to the highest bidder. It was also a location for public executions. The La Lurie Mansion, this site stands as a dark legacy of torture and injustice. Many enslaved people there succumbed to untold horrors due to Madame La Lurie's epic cruelty. Esplanade and Charters, upon removal from the ships, enslaved Africans were held captive in prison-like pens throughout the city. Several of these were located in the area of Esplanade and Charters. Men, women, and even children were locked up here. They were examined, groomed, and punished here in order to fetch a better price. Solomon Northrup was housed in one of these pens. A free man, Northrop was kidnapped from New York and brought to the city to be sold into slavery. His eloquent and painful story is told in his book, 12 Years a Slave, which was made into a major motion picture. The Tomb of the Unknown Slave, this stands as a memorial to all the uncounted enslaved people whose names have been lost to time. Many of these have been discovered in unmarked graves throughout the city. Erected in 2004, here chains and shackles form a giant cross, a sacred symbol in both Christianity and voodoo, representing power and transformation. The home of Marie Laveau. The home of the legendary voodoo queen Marie Laveau stands on St. Anne. Filled with voodoo shrines, offerings, statuary, herbs, and more, it stands as a beacon for all who honor this divine priestess. She was indeed larger than life, and in many ways larger than death, too. A businesswoman, a priestess, and a foremother, she served as an inspirational representation of the sacred feminine for us all. Marie Laveau was the first practitioner to hold open voodoo ceremonies in the United States. Many of these took place in Congo Square, the final stop on the processional and location of the ritual. Congo Square, since the 1740s, this site has been a gathering place for enslaved people, a location for markets, music, rituals, sacred rhythms, and sacred dances. Here many jazz ry rhythms were born, a sacred locale for the origins of the Mardi Gras Indians and second line traditions, and a truly sanctified spot for the honoring the ancestors of this city. My name is Denise Augustine of Our Sacred Stories. Uh, as a tour guide and researcher on black history and Afro-Creole history in New Orleans, I am fascinated by the fact that these Africans left hints all over the city. There's indinkra symbols all over the city, uh, Sankofa symbols, they have left them in the cemeteries. Uh, these people refused to be erased. The United States actually ended transatlantic slavery in 1808, and you would think that it would have uh, disappeared and the population numbers of enslaved people would have declined, when in fact, it absolutely exploded. By 1860, in Louisiana, we had over 331,000 enslaved people. 1840, New Orleans became the number one slave port in the nation. In spite of the terror that these people faced, there is nothing uh, that you can, you cannot avoid their, uh, their contribution to this culture. If you get off of a plane in New Orleans and you hear a jazz band, you have heard our ancestors. If you sit down to play the gumbo, you have heard our ancestors. And there's a reason that you're served rice with every meal. It is because these people from the Simbi-Gambian region were rice producers. And the very first slave ship that arrived in 1719 actually carried 
two barrels of rice. When you talk about honoring these people, we honor them by recognizing their contribution. We honor them by uh, understanding that what is left will never disappear. That trauma uh, and creativity is what they left us. There is nothing in this city that has not been touched by initially the people from the Senegambian region, the very first tribe being the Bambara, the Spanish brings the Con will bring the Congolese and the Angolans, and together they created the culture that uh, the world has learned to love. What is also interesting about this is the Native Americans initially were enslaved with us. It was the Spanish who outlawed the enslavement of Native Americans. What you find throughout women uh, experiencing trauma together is women are inherent to share their healing modalities. They share their plant knowledge. And luckily, uh, we adapted and adjusted to what they taught us, learned their healing ways, we taught ours. It is absolutely wonderful that we continue to express this and on April 25th, Louisiana Cabildo Museum will have a exhibit called Botanica. It is about the gardens, the landscapes, and the plant medicine uh, of Louisiana. What's absolutely wonderful is I know I can expect hordes of women going into this museum and remembering their grandmother's gardens. My grandmother had a healing garden. She also had a voodoo garden. And many of the healing plants that she used uh, were also used to make voodoo uh, products, healing oils, salves, um, uh, poultices. Uh, voodoo is a healing religion. And we ask that you join us to be educated because Hollywood has made us all demon-possessed and has done a number on voodoo that would make us all seem to be uh, somewhat crazed in our religious uh, 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 representation. So uh, it is a lot more than that. I grew up in the house with people who believed in ancestor worship. One of the things that's interesting, and I'm gonna give this to you, Ty, in a second, but I wanna make one more point. Many of the tribes that were brought here had already been converted to Islam. There's one thing that you cannot convert us out of, and that is ancestor worship. So you will never find a voodoo anything that does not have some representation of honoring our ancestors. We know that spirit never dies. And so we're asking you to join us not only for the procession, but for the voodoo ceremony to prove that we are not eating babies and whatever else Hollywood has taught you, uh, and join us in this healing procession of reparation and reconciliation. Thank you. Good day. I am Booty Chief of the Divine Prince. I am said to be the king and leader of authentic New Orleans voodoo. I'm grateful to be a part of this project. It would be uh, beyond me not to mention having met Doc Bohodan II from Benin, Ouida Benin, who came to Congo Square and visited us and ingratiated us with his presence uh, about five years ago. Um, it was really a defining moment for me in seeing voodoo sort of being brought out of the closet, brought out of the, the uh, creative spaces of movies, TV, films, and brought into a reality. And it is indeed a reality that has always been present here in New Orleans and specifically in what we believe to be the sacred space that is Congo Square. We all know the story of, of slaves not working on Sundays, therefore we weren't fed on Sundays. Therefore, we were allowed to gather in the space that we know as Congo Square, not only to drum and to dance and to remember our culture, 
but to feed ourselves, to grow beans and greens and, and fruit and, and produce. And some would even say the beginnings of uh, vending culture within our community. Others would say it was also the beginning of voodoo being associated with performance. So we see voodoo dancing, drumming, <coughs> cultural performances, but we hear very little about the ethno-cultural, spiritual, religious foundation that is voodoo. Many people have been come to believe that voodoo is witchcraft. Voodoo is not witchcraft. Voodoo is indeed nature. Nature is not witchcraft. So in acknowledging nature, we also acknowledge those who came before us, and that includes our ancestors. Congo Square has become that place where we have come to celebrate, acknowledge, feed, and promote the honoring of our ancestors and our indigenous Aboriginal ancestors in particular. Even before the first enslaved population were brought to Congo Square, it was already a sacred space by way of the Indians that already existed here, the indigenous Aboriginal Americans that already existed here. They held annual corn festivals in that space. So that ground, those trees with hundreds of years of energy also hold the spirit of our ancestors and the spirit of our, of our uh, voodoo practice and tradition. <clears throat> uh, uh, one more thing I'd like to add, which may seem a little bit more controversial, is what wasn't stripped away from us publicly went underground. And a great deal of those practices ended up in the church. So many of the practices that we see today, particularly in the black church, the evangelical church, the Catholic church, all have very deeply ancestral and, and voodoo rooted origins within them. So I invite you to come and be a part of this experience, be a part of our reconnecting again with Benin and our ancestors beyond that sacred land and let us grow this event into a family field opportunity to re-educate the world about what voodoo indeed truly, truly is. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this. Thank you. Yeah, um, our event serves uh, quite a few purposes. Um, one of which being education, because we feel that voodoo and African spirituality um, has been you know, stigmatized and demonized. Um, there's a lot of people that hear the word voodoo and they associate it with uh, witchcraft or Satanism, um, human sacrifices, and the reality is a lot of that demonization really serves not just to discredit the religion, but to discredit the people. It serves the part of the narrative where people here, enslaved Africans were brought to America and civilized away from this heathenistic culture, which isn't true. You know, you've got people coming from extremely civilized cultures, from like very rich religious traditions, literary traditions. You know, a lot of the enslaved people that came and built these plantations, they came as master architects and carpenters themselves already. So Dispelling a lot of these stigmas, I think, goes to understanding where we are at present because there's a big problem where a lot of people, black and white people in this country, look at black history as starting with slavery and look how far we've come since being slaves, never minding the rich culture and history that came before. And if you've got that as a starting point, then that serves to bring us to a lot of confusion about where we are today and currently. So along with acknowledging the past, we were really looking forward to discussing where we're at presently and how we're going to move forward together with understanding and respect for the future. Um, Congo Square itself has such a rich spiritual history. Um, you know, as Divine Prince mentioned, it was sacred grounds before any Africans or Europeans came here. And um, with that in mind, that's one of the reasons we wanted to bring the Mardi Gras Indians on board because you know, we wanted to acknowledge that part of the history as well. And Congo Square has a lot that needs to be respected, not just in terms of New Orleans history, but world history, you know? Um, African people being allowed to play the drums and preserve these rhythms through their culture, that goes right into the beginnings of jazz music. 
and even um, Fats Domino recorded in the studio across the street from Congo Square, and that's the beginning of rock and roll. And then you talk about the music that we were allowed to continue playing, where you've got the drummers going, and you've got choir leaders singing the refrain, and then you've got the backup chorus singing up the refrains and backing them up. That goes into the beginnings of hip hop music, you know, except the drummer ended up being a DJ, and then the MC was a priest but it's still an extremely African tradition. So understanding all of that and that legacy, like not just New Orleans, but the world has Congo Square to thank for a lot of things. And that's part of the recognition that we're looking for, you know, and we've been lucky enough to have a lot of different artists and culture bearers signing on um, and with uh, bringing spirituality into the, along with our procession, we've got an artist, uh, Ricardo Pustanio, who's made these, um, statues of different loa or spirits that we're going to bring with us. One being Papa Legba, who opens up the crossroads. And we've also got a uh, Ballon Lacroix, um, you know, loa over the dead in the cemetery that's going to be following us and representing the ancestors and hopefully opening the road and the path towards the path of spiritual healing. Um, some of Ricardo's uh, sculptures are actually in the front of the Healing Center. So if you've got a second, please take a look at the work because it's excellent. Uh, yeah, it's just one thing I wanted to add. Okay. So we've talked a lot about uh, this uh, Voodoo Day, our National Voodoo Day, our inaugural National Voodoo Day. Uh, the one in Benin is January 10th. We were looking for the closest Sunday that we could have our celebration or our day. And that day is January 14th. Um, we will start at 10 a.m. on the moonwalk on the river, where we'll pour our, have some history, pour our very first libation, and then we will proceed past, uh, on North Peters, past the uh, French market, which, had, and, uh, by the way, was a place that they also sold slaves across the street from Jackson Square where they also sold slaves uh, with 57 different uh, uh, auction houses uh, in that area where they sold slaves. So we could pour libations, pray, and call for healing all over this area and all over the city. But we're going to go through seven, seven to nine spots we would hope that you would join us for the very first pouring of the libation and stay with us until we do a voodoo uh, ceremony, uh, authentic voodoo ceremony in Congo Square as our ancestors once did, five blocks from the Catholic Church, I may add, and the Catholic Church said, we don't see you. But, uh, <laughs> So now uh, we, I, I can't think of a better honor or time to do this uh, at, in remembrance to them. And so we are asking for you to please join us in this sacred time. Seafood. Seafood. <laughs> oh, uh, the state of Louisiana, we're known for as a sportsman's paradise and we're also known for our seafood. We can thank the Lieutenant Governor's Office who, uh, who understands our culture, of course. He was born, raised, and rooted in Louisiana, like you know, many of us attend, uh, who have uh, um, put this together. He is supplying us with fried seafood. And so uh, if, you've, if you've never, if you're coming from out of town or you're local, we're asking you to come and break bread with us have fried seafood, and see what a real voodoo ceremony <laughs> looks like. Could, yes. you, could you give the date and the times and also what people should bring and where? Okay, January 14th, <clears throat> which is Sunday, January 14th, 10 a.m. on the moonwalk, on the river. If you can see Jackson Square from the river, directly across from Jackson Square, you're on the moonwalk. This is where we'll be. Um, after the moonwalk, the procession goes down North Peters to Esplanade and then just follow us to Congo Square. We should be arriving at Congo Square around 12 o'clock if you cannot do the walk. 
Uh, Ty will be there to do the blessing. And uh, after that, we will proceed with the ceremony, with the voodoo ceremony. What to wear? So please bring liquor, flowers, <laughs> fruit, produce, offerings for uh, the ancestors, but also offerings for uh, Papa Lepa, which will be a, a central figure to the ritual that we will perform that day. And wear white. Wear white. white. Oh, and, yes, <laughs> and absolutely wear white. Please uh, bring your white and your good energy. Good energy. Good energy is the thing, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Anybody? Questions? Are there any questions from anyone? Perhaps? I wanted to make a statement. First of all, I, I thought um, I appreciated what everyone had to say. I learned a lot. But I just want to say it ain't just Hollywood. You know, I think whenever um, co colonizers went anywhere in the world, when they saw the indigenous people, their, their ways of worship or whatever, it was always kind of demonized and, you know, it was said to be primitive or, or whatever. So it's like Hollywood just took. You know the thing they already set right. up and just and just went with it. You know, absolutely. If you're going to bring trauma to a group of people, the very first thing you have to notice is you're being dehumanized. They have to dehum dehumanize you. Remember, these people are Christians, and if they looked at you as an equal, they could not possibly, as Christians, do the things that colonizers do. So the first step is dehumanizing you so that the next step in the trauma that they're going to bring and the theft that they're going to bring is to make everything that you find sacred to make it look as though it is um, demonized or, or there's, you know, they have to associate you with something absolutely horrible. And it's happened to people around the world. The gypsies steal children, remember? Uh, the Jews were rats in, uh, when they did the, the dehumanization in the first step of their, uh, in their trauma. Uh, wherever they go, something has to be wrong with you in order for them to be able to execute colonization in the way that it's done worldwide. So there's abs you're absolutely right. They made us all, you know, we all hurt people. And when actually uh, voodoo is a healing community religion. It is to heal the community. Is there bad in it? There's bad. We live in a world that looks for balance. There's bad and good in almost everything we come in contact with with humans, right, as humans. Um, and so uh, we just want to educate and it's time to overturn some of these, some of this misinformation uh, uh, and bring compassion and understanding to this, uh, to these people and, and recognition for what they left. And I think that's one of the most important things about this event actually. Um, as Mama Denise mentioned, we have received the report of uh, Lieutenant Governor Billy Nongesser. We also have spoken to several city council members that have understood our mission and our vision. And um, we recently had a meeting with the mayor where she signed on with support and said that she's going to help us any way that we can. It's so big with all these negative stigmas that we have such official support coming for this event where we want to actually elucidate the divinity and the healing practices of our culture because we've got the support of these different institutions and which historically have not had our backs or have gone along with the status quo painting negative images. So just having these officials on board with us, it marks a momentous change in the acknowledgement of something that, that's huge, you know? And New Orleans and Company as well. Uh, and New Orleans and Company as well um, is interested in our mission of spreading education and the cultural significance of this. And just that official backing is momentous, you know, because it really helps to validate what we're doing and showing that these different organizations support and get the mission and think that it's important too.
you know, it's it's other it's different groups reaching out with olive branches and understanding one another and wanting to listen. And that's that's healing right there, you know? Yeah, I just wanna echo what Nate was saying about if we look at it historically, we have things like the black codes and we have things like where it was illegal for any of these spiritual items to even be possessed by any of the practitioners. So this hundreds of years of demonization, I think is really being turned on its head with the support that we're getting now from the officials and the structure that's in place in New Orleans. And that, as a practitioner of 30 years, that warms my heart in ways that I never thought I would see. Yeah. Uh, what I know, owning a tour company, what I know about New Orleans and company is nothing happens without them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I get, uh, I get uh, I'm get. i a member of New Orleans and company, and what I know is I'll ask people, Where's my advertising, advertising money going? I go, how did you find me? Oh, well, you know, we, we looked up, you know, black tour companies or, you know, we wanted the real story from, you know, real native people. And I landed on this page and I saw you, uh, I saw our sacred stories there. So yeah, we want to thank the, the, uh, everyone, all these organizations that have supported. I might ask you one question, it, it looks like, in many uh, jurisdictions around the country, uh, even in legislatures, they're doing their best to suppress uh, the reportage of the history of, of slavery, uh, Jim Crow, uh, reconstruction, segregation. Uh, I think, is this an opportunity to? Absolutely. Uh, With the book banning going on and, you know, this critical race theory and this kind of suppression of black history. You cannot heal until you acknowledge what happened, what the problem is, the continuation of these things. If this nation is gonna heal, that is the first step. Oh, we had a problem. We corrected this problem but then we went back and we legislated these people into second-class citizenship. And so uh, this is a time that education is important, to recognition is important, and that we come to a, listen, y'all, you know, people can, they can try to go to the moon all they want. This planet is all we have. These resources are all we have. And until we learn to live together, no one is going to be comfortable. No one is going to be safe. And so acknowledging the problem, <coughs> acknowledging what these people brought, taking advantage of the gifts that they left us and the gifts that they still are giving us. Our children are still playing jazz, roots of music. We're still raising up jazz musicians. We're still raising up excellent Creole cooks. We're act raising up young literary people. We're raising up another, a new breed of people who are going back to their ancestral uh, uh, religion to seek strength. Sankofa says, when you're moving forward on something, you have a project, you're moving forward, and you hit that wall, or you can't find any more creativity. Sankofa says, reach back to your ancestors, reach back to the strength and the spirit of them, and then come back and move forward again. Now, if that's not a philosophy, philosophy for the world, I don't know what is. So you're right, but you know, information is like jello. You can't nail it against the wall, <laughs> and, it, and you cannot stop it from being passed, no matter how much legislation you pass people will tell the stories of their families. And that's such an important point. You know, in a world that's trying to, we've got different states and groups trying to outlaw teaching critical race theory, uh, the premise being that it makes white people feel bad or uncomfortable. You know, in psychology, when you have trauma and you push it back and you deny it and don't acknowledge it, that causes repression that causes a shadow self, that causes all these other underlying subconscious feelings that express themselves in other issues. These issues on a national scale would be things like hatred, you know, um, hate crimes, and 
difficulty communicating and seeing one another as human beings and a lot getting in the way of our own empathy. And that's one of the reasons why we keep on saying that it's important for our present and for our future. Because if people are trying to outlaw teaching critical race theory and the story of how we got here and understanding one another, then we can't move forward with more understanding. It blocks so much of our relationships going forward and causes a lot of other issues. So this is an opportunity for us to, for a certain part, you know, take control of that narrative and speak our truth, which, you know, if they're gonna make it hard to do in schools, we've gotta make sure that this knowledge and information gets out there. Thank you.